Music, one of the most dazzling fruits of human civilization, can make us weep or make us dance. It's reflected the times in which it was written. It has delighted, challenged, comforted and excited us. In this series, I've been tracing the story of music from scratch. To follow it on its miraculous journey, misleading jargon and fancy labels are best put to one side. Instead, try to imagine how revolutionary and how exhilarating many of the innovations we take for granted today were to people at the time. There are a million ways of telling the story of music. This is mine. In the 31 years between the death of Richard Wagner in 1883 and the outbreak of the First World War, music was shaken by a series of rebellions. Russian music swept westwards exuberantly, as did the exotic sounds of distant continents. And symphonies and operas of astonishing intensity amazed and startled audiences. Modernism in music was born. The world was becoming a smaller place, with millions of poor European immigrants seeking refuge in the New World to join the white settlers, African Americans and Chinese workers already there. From this rich mix of musical cultures, soon to be heard on new-fangled record players and radios, would spring the blues, ragtime and jazz, in just over three decades, music underwent a series of gigantic convulsions. Change came in many different forms, some exciting, some bewildering. Revolution was in the air, and all of music's laws and traditions were about to be shaken to their roots. What happened was a series of musical rebellions. The first was aimed at displacing the musical giant of the late 19th century, Richard Wagner. His ideas, his style and his musical philosophy had been such a pervasive presence in classical music that what might have followed him was a plague of pseudo-Wagners. In fact, what followed in his wake was an explosion of musical activity that sought to do things very differently indeed. It may not always have been deliberate, but there was a kind of not-Wagner renaissance. All the things he hated most came to life. The French, for a start. In France, a new wave of composers made it their business to write music of deliberate simplicity and clarity, and to banish pretension and earnestness of all kinds. The French were about to enjoy a musical golden age, thanks to their reaction against Wagner. Their best 50 years ever in music blossomed after he went off to his personal Valhalla, with Faure, Debussy and Ravel leading a glorious riposte to German musical dominance. The movement was set in train by one of the most remarkable figures in music, Eric Satie. Eric Satie's first Gymnopody of 1888, as well as sounding like a long, hot afternoon after a boozy lunch, can be seen as the first shot in a war to debunk pomposity and declutter French music. Satie, described by his tutors at the Paris Conservatoire as the laziest student ever, was an eccentric intellectual who hung out with other arty dreamers in Montmartre. Satie's music could hardly sound less like Wagner and what the Germans were up to. 
The irony is that there was a German influence on the work of Satie's Parisian contemporaries. Here's a clue. Composers like César Franck, Charles-Marie Vidor, Camille Saint-Saëns and Gabriel Fauré were all trained organists. And playing the organ means, above all, knowing one particular composer's work inside out. J.S. Bach. More than a hundred years after his death, these organist composers in France were invigorated and inspired by Bach's clarity and economy. Even the master himself might have admired Charles-Marie Vidor's famous Toccata. It was first performed by Vidor himself at the Trocadero Palace in Paris in 1889, and it's given a rousing send-off to many a newly hitched bride and groom ever since. The dignity and dexterity of Bach can also be heard in the music of Gabriel Fauré, perhaps the most talented of these French organist composers. Listening to Fauré after Brahms, Liszt, Wagner or Tchaikovsky is as if someone has spring-cleaned and redecorated a teenage boy's bedroom. Gone are the posters of death, psychological torment, superheroes and tragedy. The augmented piles of clothes have been put away and the windows have been opened to dispel the diminished sneaker-smelling air. Foray's exquisite music simply says chill, or perhaps refrigerez-vous. The exquisite pieces of Satie, Saint-Saëns, Fauré and the new wave of French composers were mostly small in scale. The next important step in the non-Wagner rebellion took place in the realm of symphonic music. And the composer who carried the torch for large-scale orchestral and vocal music after Wagner was about as different from him as a human being could be. Though he championed Wagner's operas as music director of the Vienna State Opera House, Wagner would have despised him because he was Jewish. He was Gustav Mahler. The hallmark of Mahler's music is that of openness. Unlike Wagner, Mahler invited into his music all the sounds and rhythms and the noisy diversity of the bustling East European communities at Vienna's doorstep, the capital of the sprawling Austro-Hungarian Empire. As an outsider in Vienna, a Jew, a Czech, a poor country boy in a profession full of toffs, it's not surprising that Mahler should identify with the folklore and music of his small-town childhood. In his symphonies, it's possible to identify, for example, the klezmer style of strolling Jewish folk musicians. His music encompasses passing military bands, And he's not afraid to include boisterous children's choruses. Mahler's symphonies are music's gateway to the 20th century, a musical equivalent of New York's Ellis Island, where Europe's exhausted and oppressed peoples sought refuge and a new start. The musical cultures they'd left behind in Europe found a home in Mahler's generous symphonic embrace. One way we can see a modern perspective emerging in his music is its sense of reality, of truthfulness, warts and all. The frankness of his approach is a major break with the past and is much more characteristic of the 20th than the 19th centuries. How can music be honest? Well, before Mahler, if you were a composer and you wanted to write a piece about loneliness or despair or depression, 
you'd call it something generic like a nocturne or a sonata pathétique. In an opera, you could have singers act out emotional or political issues pretending to be someone from another era in a fancy costume. But Mahler stopped all this role-playing. He wanted to evoke the real, contemporary world with all its actual suffering and joy, without pretense. He told it how it was. Mahler took our worst fears and set them to music. This may seem an unremarkable concept to us, but in 1900 it was shockingly, distressingly new. The unflinching honesty of Mahler's approach is at times unbearable. From 1901, for example, he set to music five German poems called Kinder Totenlieder, songs on the death of children. The sentiments of the songs are those of a parent's most unspeakable nightmares. In Mahler's unflinching settings, these distant people of another century suddenly become like us. He's made them real. In a horrible irony, four years after he wrote the songs, Mahler's own five-year-old daughter, Anna Maria, died of scarlet fever. And Mahler himself was diagnosed with a terminal heart condition. When he died in 1911, he was laid to rest in her grave. But despite the understandable sadness and alienation we hear in his music, there is incredibly hope of something better, usually associated with childhood and youth, as in his Song of the Earth. The final chord of the Song of the Earth was described by the mid 20th century English composer Benjamin Britten as being imprinted on the atmosphere. But there's something else going on in Mahler's music that wasn't perhaps obvious at the time. It's deceptive. Because of its all-inclusive style, with its borrowings from ethnic folk music, and because of the intensity of feeling he wanted to convey, Mahler's music began to destabilize the centuries-old Western musical system he'd inherited. His pupils in Vienna, led by Arnold Schoenberg, actively wanted to dismantle completely the familiar systems that had underpinned all music for hundreds of years and replace them with a brand new system. This academic rebellion was later labelled serialism or atonality and it produced decades of scholarly hot air, books, debates and seminars and in its purest, strictest form, not one piece of music that a normal person could understand or enjoy in 100 years. That's not to say that serialism hasn't always had a cultish following, but for sure these composers weren't courting a mainstream audience. Had serialism had any chance of appealing to a paying public, one composer who would surely have opted into it was the musical magpie Richard Strauss, Germany's leading composer after Mahler's death. But he had other far more mischievous plans up his sleeve. He began his career, conventionally enough, in a musical style that owed much to Liszt and a little to Wagner. Thus Spake Zarathustra is pretty typical, with its now legendary opening sunrise, made even more famous by Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. <laughs> <laughs> 
Kubrick uses the power of the piece to underscore a momentous leap forward in the evolution of man. the idea the film wants to convey, man's discovery of weapons, needs equally portentous music. No one did it better than Strauss. And yet, the ever-versatile Strauss could also write songs of heartbreaking, marlerish delicacy, like the song Tomorrow composed as a wedding present for his wife. On the surface of it, the words of Morgan seem to be optimistic about the future, and tomorrow the sun will shine again. But it's also strangely melancholy. It seems to suggest, in fact, that there will be no tomorrow. It seemed at this point as if Strauss would continue to compose in this wistful but fairly traditional manner. But then he suddenly catapulted himself into musical notoriety with an opera of savage erotic power that shocked bourgeois society and created a sensation. In one fell swoop, from being the genteel Kapellmeister of the Austrian Belle Epoque, Strauss had transformed himself into the Che Guevara of the musical Rebels. The opera in question was Salome, staged in 1905. It was immediately banned in several countries and it gave new meaning to the term discord. Even before Salome herself had stripped off for the Dance of the Seven Veils and scandalised the first night audience. Salome's final passionate solo, addressed to the severed head of John the Baptist, which she then kisses, was the Quentin Tarantino moment. You can either read Salome as a strong, independent young woman who gets what she wants by exploiting her sexuality, cleverly outwitting her stepfather the king in the process, or as a kind of demented junkie who lowers humanity's moral standards to rock bottom. Take your pick. Strauss apparently hedges his bets, giving the first mention of the necrophiliac kiss, possibly the most dissonant chord ever used in music at that point. It's like the final howl of a busted civilization. But we're not finished with her yet. After asking whether the taste of blood on his lips is actually the taste of love, Salome revisits the kiss in supreme triumph. I have now kissed your mouth, Yohanan, she screams, and Strauss unleashes a musical earthquake which might be construed as a sexual consummation. Again, make up your own mind. King Herod, who had encouraged his stepdaughter to dance in the first place, now ordered his soldiers to kill her. For this climax, Strauss reserved his most discordant and angry music yet. 
this point in musical history, it looked as though the dominance of Austro-German music that began with Bach in 1700 might continue indefinitely. Instead, a new force had emerged and was by the early 20th century the most exhilarating sound in Europe. In the closing decades of the 19th century, the sleeping giant of Russia had awoken. Music was never going to be the same again. And when it comes to rebellions, Russia is in a class of its own. For all of the 18th and most of the 19th centuries, Russia doggedly copied the culture of Western Europe, which the Russian court deemed more sophisticated and interesting than anything homegrown. Even Russia's most famous composer of them all, Tchaikovsky, who became a worldwide star in the 1880s and 90s, was still composing in a style that owed more to Beethoven or Brahms than to anything he'd picked up on the banks of the Volga. But there was something Tchaikovsky excelled at that was distinctly Russian and that contained within it the seeds of a coming revolution, dance. If for Italians the supreme expression of their love of music was the emotionally charged operatic aria, for Russians it was dance, and Tchaikovsky wrote some of the most celebrated and memorable dance music of all time. The result of this flowering and dance is that the need for a driving rhythm began to change the character of the music itself, making it more robust, muscular and exciting. Russian music was about to explode into a life in a manner that was unprecedented and subsequently unmatched in history. In Russia, the invigorating, regulated beat of dance is everywhere. At the ballet, in operas, on the concert stage, lilting, driving, whirling, tiptoeing, leaping, gliding, jumping, gyrating and twirling. Russian music can't get enough of it. Presumably, it's the cold. You have to keep moving or your circulation will pack in. The rhythms of dance first powered this Russian awakening. The second vital element, which changed the melody and harmony, came from a renewed interest in Russia's own religious heritage. A new breed of composers, starting in the 1880s, turned their attention not to the musical traditions of Western Europe, but to those of their own, especially the centuries-old Russian Orthodox chants with their deep basses and thick eight or sixteen voice block chords. In the decades to follow, this ancient sound known as Znameni chant was to flow like a river into the choral texture of all Russian composers. No longer did they look west for inspiration. The fuse lighter of the Russian firework display about to unfold, the truly original creative pathfinder, wasn't cosmopolitan, well-travelled friend of the Romanovs Tchaikovsky, but a former military cadet who worked in the civil service and had a fatal vodka habit, Modest Mazogsky. <laughs> Mazogsky is quite simply the most original composer of the late 19th century, a one-off, whose ideas were new, not derived from other composers of his time. There's a reason for this. Mazogsky wasn't musically trained at a conservatoire and he wasn't a professional composer. He was self-taught and therefore blissfully unaware of the rules he was breaking. It was like he'd wandered on to Tsarist Russia's Got Talent 
slightly drunk, and started improvising at the piano to everyone's amazement. Despite the naivety of his style, which earned him more than a little ridicule at the time, Mazorsky showed that Russian music could carve its own identity. To see how radically the music of Russia had changed in fewer than 40 years, listen to this coronation scene from A Life for the Tsar, an opera written by the Russian composer Mikhail Glinka in 1836. Glinka had his musical training in Italy, Austria and Germany, and it shows. Now listen to another Kremlin coronation scene from the thoroughly Russian opera by Mazogsky, Boris Godunov. This time, complete with colours, voices and glittering effects, tolling bells and echoing orchestra chimes, it's been thoroughly Russianized. Mazorsky died in 1881, his music virtually unknown outside of Russia, but that was about to change. So many of the seeds of the rebellions of late 19th century music can be traced to one extraordinarily fertile event. It took place in Paris in 1889, the centenary of the French Revolution. It was the World's Fair. Here in the Trocadero, which overlooked the newly built Eiffel Tower, Vidor first played his famous organ toccata. And here also, non-Russian composers heard the music of Mazorsky for the first time. One such composer, then aged 27, was Claude Debussy. His visit to the World's Fair was a life and music-changing experience. What Debussy learnt from Mazorsky was that there was a way of building up the architecture of a piece of music that was an alternative to the developmental method that was bread and butter to Haydn, Mozart and Beethoven. The development approach was to take small cells of melody or rhythm or both and make up a whole discourse from them over a 15 or 20 minute period. So Beethoven is able to construct a whole symphony movement from this tiny idea. Count how many times he uses it in just the first 40 bars of the symphony. That's 13. That's already 33 and counting. Debussy, inspired by Mazorsky, ditched 100 years of studious development technique and started over. Mazorsky, because he knew no better, and Debussy, because it suited his taste for experiment. What revolutionised Debussy's music more than anything, though, was a wind of change blown into the Paris World's Fair from very far afield. The World's Fair showcased exhibits and cultural tableau from all over the planet. Thanks to increased communications, the global village was starting to become a reality. What especially mesmerised Debussy was a Javanese village, complete with a gamelan orchestra, 
with its gongs, bells, bowls and xylophone-like chimes. The particular sonorities and scales of the Gamelan Orchestra intrigued Debussy so much he was inspired to attempt an evocation of its eastern sounds on a western piano. Although he couldn't replicate the unfamiliar tuning of the bells, gongs and other metal bars of the Gamelan, or the exact division of the Asian musical scale, he could approximate it in two ways. One was to make use of the so-called pentatonic scale, the five notes that are common to all the world's musical systems, and which are especially prevalent in Eastern music. On a piano, the pentatonic notes can be found by playing just the black notes. There's a whole section of his prelude, Voile, Sails, which is all pentatonic. <laughs> 